Welcome to our weekly Shabbat gathering. We're just some friends that get together to share what the Father is doing in our lives and, and um, to uh, talk about the article that was sent out uh, Friday. And uh, you're welcome to join us if you'd like, uh, after you're viewing this video, if, if you would like to participate. My email address is at the bottom of this YouTube video. So send me an email expressing your desire. And next week, I will send you an invitation. So with that, we've got, um, we've got some folks that are already here, JP and Luz. And Luz, you said you have a question. Yeah, um, and it has to do with the Nazarite vow. So is this something that is that everyone can partake in, meaning male and female? And I'm under the impression that you can do this Nazarite vow for a lifetime or... Um, temporarily depending on I guess depending on the person and do you know anything about that JP so from what I've read over over the years a little bit that I've read over the years and maybe Harold has more information but um it, it it is it seems to be the choice of the person of how long they want to do this that there is an end to it according to, to the scripture i don't have my my uh my bible here with me but any, according to the scripture there's usually it's it's a time frame and if i'm if i'm not mistaken i think paul did that in, in the new in in the messianic writings i think paul did a vow for a little while i, I really don't know what it was about it doesn't really go into detail but it did say that it did a vow. And I have, actually, I have a friend of mine that's been following that vow for oh, many years now. Many years. He hasn't cut his hair. He hasn't drank wine. He hasn't all, all the, so um, it's obviously it's, it's, it's a choice of the person. Um, right. I know, I know Harold, I believe is, is, um, has chosen, I believe, to do the Nazarite vow as well. But, I have, I have, yes. Um, I don't know. <clears throat> the, in the, in the, the scripture does not, does not um, say anything about women oh. taking the vow. However, when you consider that we are the, the fulfillment of those of the Tanakh because of the resurrection of Yeshua, uh, Shaul, the Hebrew apostle Paul, says uh, in his writings that there is, in the kingdom, there is no male, no female, no Jew, no Gentile, no slave, no free. We're, we are all one. Mm. And so from that perspective, I would say that the Nazarite vow would also be available to women yeah. since, since well, there is no male or female in the kingdom. Well, it's been confirmed. I reread it again, and it does sp specify both. It says, this is uh, Numbers chapter 6, the first, uh, first and second and third uh, verse. It says, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them whether when either a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite, to separate himself to the Lord. He shall separate himself from wine and strong drip. But it's interesting because it says he. 
he shall drink no vinegar made from wine or strong drink and shall not drink any juice of grapes or eat grapes from fresh or uh, eat grapes fresh or dried. Even though he does say whether he, when either a man or a woman is interesting because he says he shall separate himself. I, I believe, I believe uh, JP has investigated the use of pronouns um, in these translations. Right. So what, sorry, what, sorry. What, what, what did so, he come across? Right. So what, so <clears throat> in the Hebrew language, there is no it. Everything has a masculine or a feminine, everything. So when, depending on how the sentence is structured, because he wouldn't, the, the, whoever, when it, when it got written, he wouldn't have writ, writ, written he slash she back then. They, they, it, it, it would have been done in, in one uh, gender or another. So the, 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 whoever wrote that part um, decided to go with he after saying that it can be a man or a woman. Which is which is very consistent with throughout the Tanakh, uh, what's been renamed the Old Testament, the way um, that usage is presented. Now that brings up another interesting question, and I hope I word it correctly. Throughout the Tanakh, excuse me, I'm eating cinnamon candy. Throughout the Tanakh, he, when he references, when Father references Israel, there are certain verses where he'll reference her. Why? Because she's the bride. He, Yahweh married Israel at Sinai. He, he had them to make vows, um, marriage vows with him through Moses um, at that event. And it was why later he could divorce them. Um, so when he references Israel, it's because she is his bride. You wrote an article about that because most Christians believe that they are the bride. Right. You, you, you hear that all the time that they, they say that we're the bride and but if, if you, again, if we look really deeply at scripture, it, that's not what the writings say. John the Immerser clearly points to Yeshua and says, here comes the bridegroom. Now, if he is the bridegroom and we are his body, we are the bridegroom. Uh, we are with, you know, we are Yeshua in this earthly realm. And so we become the bridegroom. And there's no precedent set in scripture for somebody marrying themselves. You can't be a, a bridegroom and a bride at the same time. It, it, it's, it, it, it's just, there's no precedent for that. So when you, when you understand that Israel is the bride and Yeshua becomes the bridegroom, now people are gonna, are gonna question this because Yeshua is the son of Yahweh. He's not Yahweh himself. So how can the son marry the bride of Yahweh. And it is, um, there's a scripture 
in that article about um, that answers that um, I can't remember the can't remember what it is right offhand, but um, it it speaks of the sons marrying their mothers, uh, which lays precedent for what Yeshua was able to do with, with the bride. And it's because when Yeshua uh, became Ichad with the father, it was, it became co-ownership of the kingdom and because of the authority that he received in that co-ownership he then had the um the authority to become the bridegroom to the bride because he, he, when you have co-ownership of something each party is responsible for the other's actions and it 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 becomes a shared uh, situation. And so he's sharing that authority from Yahweh uh, because the Tanakh states that once a woman has been divorced, she can't marry again unless the, um, the husband dies. There has to be a death. And that death was accomplished uh, by Yeshua, taking the authority given to him as the kinsman redeemer um, to take that whole thing on. So when he was resurrected, he was able then to be the, the bridegroom to the bride who is Israel. <laughs> Did that make sense? I guess not. It may, well, it made perfect sense to me. I don't know about those, but. Well, no, I understand what he's saying um, clearly. Um, I do. It's a, uh, it's a, it's 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 a, a exercise that is not fully appreciated in our modern culture, uh, but it's along the lines of if a in the Tanakh again it says that if if a if a woman's husband dies one of the brothers of the husband can, can marry her. And you have to understand that in, in the Tanakh, there's no restriction of a man having multiple wives. Um, back then it was it was part of their part of their custom, part of their culture. So would it be safe to say that a per, a man can remarry, can have multiple wives even today? Um, yeah. Now, practically, I don't see how they do it. <laughs> well, where does, I don't get, where does the infidelity part that's in the in in the in the Tanakh, isn't it? In the Tanakh, in the in the ten words of the Father. Yeah. It says, so how does that? It says a woman shall not commit adultery. A man shall not commit adultery with a woman who is married. Now, their sexual mor mores in that culture were, were different than what ours is today. And it was not, it's not against the Tanakh for a man and a woman to have intercourse if, if neither one of them is married or betrothed. 
Um, now, according to, to scripture, from Yahweh's perspective, <clears throat> the only standard for marriage, it, it, there's no, there's no uh, pattern for a marriage ceremony anywhere in scripture. Because in the beginning, in Genesis, the father said, a man shall leave his mother and father and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Not one spirit, but one flesh. And so when, when a man and a woman have intercourse, according to Yahweh, that's marriage. Now, the, 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 the Hebrews of that time understood that concept of marriage. They do have a celebration. Yeshua went to one of those. But in that celebration, what happens is, is that a, a man becomes betrothed to his, his wife after making agreements with the father. And if she accepts, they are betrothed. And that is the marriage. Now, they're not... They're not um, they're not living together. They're, it's not a, um, what's, what's the word for it, JP? They're not, they're not uh, living under one roof. They're not cohabiting. cohabiting. They're not cohabiting because that tradition says that the man should, after being betrothed, he should go and prepare a place for his bride. And then once that is done and the father sees it and, and, and agrees on it, uh, puts his blessing on it, then, the, then it says that the, the man will come in the dead of night when bride is, is unaware and shall take her back to that place. And there they will have intercourse and become cohabitating in that place that he prepared. That is the cultural um, significance of a marriage, but the marriage is not a marriage until first they're betrothed. Uh, from, from Yahweh's eyes, his perspective, the marriage is not a marriage until they have consummated. Now, this is part of the reason that Joseph was wanting to uh, put Mary away because even though couples um, did have intercourse before they were cohabiting, cohabitating, it is it was frowned on. It was a social. Um, no, no, it, 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 it was socially unacceptable, not scripturally, but socially. And so Joseph was having impregnated Mary, was wrestling with this situation because he didn't want Mary to have to go through, you know, that, uh, that stigma, which is why an angel had to appear to Joseph to reinforce the fact that he was now married to, to Mary and an angel appeared to Mary to um, support her as well. And, and it's why Mary left uh, Galilee and went to live with Elizabeth. Uh, you remember John the Immerser was in Elizabeth and he leaped inside when Mary came being pregnant with Yeshua. And uh, so Mary helped Elizabeth in her birth. And uh, we're, we're not, I don't remember if we're told where Mary's birth took place. 
I don't think it was in Galilee. It was in Bethlehem. So she didn't go back to Galilee. She went to Bethlehem to the um, to the um, place of their both both she and Joseph's inheritance that had been passed down through that family, and that's where she had um, Yeshua. So it was it was just a matter of getting out from under that social. St- stigma that they were concerned with and uh it's how they wound up um in bethlehem okay and then moved to nazareth and then um yeah i said galilee earlier it was it was nazareth um, they moved back to their hometown of Nazareth. And interestingly enough, Nazareth means separation. Really? Yes. Well, see there, you learn something new every day. So, so that's why that's why the Nazareth that's why the Nazareth by bow is to separate yourself from from things. It's to, uh, not it. The Nazarite vow is not a Nazareth vow. No, no, no. But but Nazarite and Nazareth mean the same thing. It's a separation. Okay. There you why, go. Why was the vow given to be, or why was it started to begin with? It, it, it doesn't say. Um, when, when, <clears throat> when you start on this walk, and you end up like like most of us in religions. And then what, what is really, really, really difficult to explain is relationship. So people get involved in all these different religions by information and by mental belief or deduction. It's not experiential, it's, it's information. So people believe the information and then they, they, they sort of get, you know, encouraged to believe these things within the religions that they're in. In, in the Hebrew perspective, it's identity, it's experience. It's, and that's where it becomes very diff, difficult to, to explain because it's how do you explain relationship, right? Intimacy and, and that's where people are struggling to go from one side to the other. So the vow, it doesn't say in scripture why the vow was given, but it was given for a time of separation. So for whatever reason, the person decided, and again, it's about relationship. They would have gotten an indication from Yahweh, from father, to do this vow, to go through this vow. Somehow by spirit or by a dream or they, and, and this is what is sometimes difficult to relate to other people, the explanation of why it's it's there is not there. But if our imuna, if our faith, we know that Father's going to guide us through whatever it is that we need to do. And that's a that that's that's the struggle that a lot of people have because we're we're not taught that. So if we if we don't have some sort of spiritual experience where we that's that's why it's difficult for a lot of people to wrap their head around the information because they haven't had experience. Why why the vow is there? It, it's it's not clear, but it, it is a separation from different things. And uh, and, and, and then after that, and then after that, you've got the priestly prayer, right? You've got at the end of Numbers chapter six, you've got the priestly prayer that talks about you know, Yahweh protecting and having, having, uh, I, I forget exactly the words, but it, it's, you have the priestly prayer of peace and protection and may countenance and, and, and all that. And it, it is, a, it is, I have found that it is a, a place 
where you garner the strength to be able to proceed in what the father <clears throat> is asking you to do. In Samson's case, you know, he was given this great strength. Um, and there was, there was something that the father had intended for that strength to, to address at some point. Uh, Samson abrogated the, the vow when, when his hair was cut. Uh, he still had the strength, but it wasn't. It wasn't being addressed to whatever Yahweh intended it to. Now, he he was because he was in captivity. You know, he was able to to he repented and he was able to use that strength to bring down the the house of the Philistines, I believe, and. Um, and it, he brought it down on himself. Um, but that, that is a, a picture of, like I said, an abrogation of what the father wanted. In my case, I, f I have found that, that I have been, I have been given the strength in resources and, availability and um, you know everything that I have needed in order to amass these articles and publish them every week um, to those who have ears to hear. I, I constantly get emails from people who castigate the fact that, you know, Yeshua was a phony, Paul was a fraud. You know, I mean, just all kinds of things. And they want answers to those. And I have to write them back and tell them that I'm not commissioned. <laughs> the Father has not commissioned me to change anybody's mind about anything. All he has commissioned me to do is to present the truth of the words of scripture as he has shown them to me. And then whatever happens with those words and how they affect other people's lives is up to the father. Now I can, I can be able to clarify a lot of the words that are being said in the, in the manner in which I presented them, but as far as, you know, going out and buttonhole people and trying to change their mind about, you know, what they believe, it's, that's not my uh, purview. I do have people that come and are honestly on this journey to truth, and they're, and they're coming out of this religion uh, because they're seeing that it's, it's a man-made deal and they're not getting the whole truth. And so they're on this journey out from religion to truth. It's the same journey that, that all of us have experienced. And so what I'm able to do is share with them my experience and coming out and what the father has shown me. And it helps them to, you know, make another step or two in, in that, uh, toward that truth the truth of who Yahweh is. Have you not found that to be similar in your lives? As oh, for far, me very much. As far as what? What part? That the journey of, of coming out of religion towards truth and being able to um, share some of that with people who are experiencing the same thing. I'm having a hard time with that 
in the sense that, and I think I might've shared this recently. I don't know if I shared it with you, but I, you know, I'm having the one, that's one of the, the thoughts that I have is how do I, how do I share this, this experience, experience, you know, you will know them by their fruits, right? However, my, my dealings with the outside is going to work. And when I get there, and I know you shared your story with when you were uh, working at in the in the printing, they were you were working, and these this woman came up to you and said, "Are you?" And you know there was something about you that. But I guess because I'm not seeing that in my life, I feel that maybe I'm not. I don't know. Maybe I'm not manifesting that uh, in me that people see the father in me which now makes me say to myself, well, maybe I'm not, I tend to think that, that maybe there's something wrong with my walk in the father that it doesn't emulate light in me towards to others. Or it could just very well be that people just, which I believe, for the most part, people are just not interested in the father or in truth. You know, I can only answer that according to the experience that the father took me through. And with me, what he did is I, I started this journey toward truth coming out of religion and he benched me. He benched you? He benched me for 10 years. I mean, I couldn't talk to anybody about any of this because it, it would just blow up in my face. And <clears throat> of course, I'm coming out of a tradition of men that says you got to go out and, and, and you know, uh, save people. I mean, when I mentioned keeping Shabbat, <clears throat> it just blew up and I never got any I mean I wasn't able to get anybody to listen to what was going on with me for 10 years the reason it took me so long was because I kept going back and trying <laughs> and the father was saying to Harold shut up <laughs> just be quiet and learn of me no, begin to know who I am. And you know, you don't, in any relationship, you don't really know a person unless you have been intimately involved with them for years. <clears throat> you know, the people that I had relationship with that I thought were my friends, You know, when I came along with this with this stuff, they 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 called me a heretic, and they wouldn't let their children play with my children. They cut a, cut me off, cut my wives off, and it just it was a it was a just a, a total nightmare that was you know took place in front of me, and I I didn't know why until <clears throat> after that 10 year period. And I was able to look back and see the father was telling me to shut up. And if I had just obeyed his, what he was telling me, I, you know, I'm not saying it wouldn't have taken, you know, 10 years, but I, I think I would have come, come around to knowing him a lot, a lot sooner. I don't know that, <clears throat> that I would have, but so what you're experiencing, Luz, is he's benching you. <laughs> That's all he's doing. And the reason he's doing it is so that you become full of him in the knowledge that 
that the things that you're that you are beginning to come to know about him we first we first you know get it in our intellect but it's not until it becomes life in us that we're able to be able to express it to others but even even that expression will only take root in somebody who is pursuing this same journey to truth that we that we have it's it's this is a very solitary life it's not a lonely life because we have our conversation with the father on a daily basis but it is solitary and when he's when he's saying be separate from the world he's talking about everybody that's in the world that is not on this journey toward truth. When well, they it's everybody and everything, I believe everything in this world that does not pertain to him, you know, that has no dealings with him. And I say that because, you know, even being in, you know, even being in anything that's out there that's of the world man-made that does not the way I see it and I could be wrong but the way that doesn't glorify father doesn't bear fruit to father but gives pleasure to the world or to the worldly things I would think that 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 like I have for me I choose not to partake in any kind of events that are coming up in this in the summer um, because amongst those people, I feel there are people of the world that I choose or wish not to mingle with. I don't know if that makes it right, though. Well, just, I guess, for me, I always look at how Yeshua, we have to remember that Yeshua cultivated his relationship with Father for 33 years. Now, he had, he had, he sort of had a, a, um, um, I guess an advantage because he was he was here for a special purpose and he had a mother you know Yeshua had a mother and father that taught him the way and but he still cultivated that for 33 years before publicly coming out and sort of I'll use the word ministry but having his his following and, and everything that he did so 30, I when I look at my life what? 30 years it was 30 years. Yeah, sorry, sorry, 30 years. Yes, yes. <clears throat> so when, when I look at my life, I think, well, you know, how long have I been cultivating spirit? Not as long as that. And, and the other thing, I also choose not to partake of the world unless he tells me to go. And that, that is, that's the other thing, right? Yeshua did nothing unless he heard or saw the father do it. So with cultivation of spirit, you're going to come to a place sometimes where you're going to end up going to the things of the world to share what the Father wants you to share. But that comes with time. That comes with experience. That comes with intimacy, with building relationship. I heard a story a long time ago. It was a man living in the woods, and he was uh, sort of in a cabin. And he wanted to hear from God. You know, he was hearing all these people were hearing from God. And and, 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 you know, I, I want to hear from God. And, and he heard nothing. For years and years, he heard nothing. One day, Father spoke to him. Now, he lived by a, a pit, a quarry, a pit where there was a lot of rock. And there was a huge rock by his uh, cabin. One day, he heard the Father go push the rock. So he went out there and he started pushing on that rock. And he pushed. And he pushed. A day. Three days. A week. A month, four months goes by. He walks into the house one day, drops on his knees, and said, Father, I can't do this anymore. You, you, told me to, to, you told me to move the rock. That's not what he had said. He said to push the rock. Father then says, look at you now. And he looked at himself. Look at your arms. Look at your chest. Look at your back. He was built. He had worked. For six months, I'm pushing on that rock. Now you're ready to go out and work. He hadn't heard from him for years, right? 
So it, I guess it's just a little story or an analogy that he waited for Father to talk. He did what Father told him to do, him thinking that he was going to move the rock. But that was the preparation for him to be able to be fit, to be able to go out to deal with what he needed to deal with. So I guess a little story, a little parable as to that's how he deals with us. And I can understand Louis being a bit discouraged because sometimes you feel that you're not used or you're not hearing or you're not, but that intimate time, that, that, that special time that you're gonna, you're gonna spend with father is gonna create this intimacy and bring a reality of who he is out. You, you, the, 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 your spirit and the thinking is gonna change where you're gonna be manifesting who he is and again that comes with intimacy and with time but just listening to you and hearing you i know that that is coming because you have emuna you have that faith in father it's 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 the growing pains of, of time and you know there was a there was a a time in my life after I had come out and I had been on the bench for about 10 years that the father said, go to Israel. Now, when I first met him uh, 40 years before that on the, on the road, that dirt road in California, uh, he, you know, he told me that I would be living in Israel. Well, I thought it was going to be the next week <laughs> or, or surely the next month. And 40 years later, he he was faithful to his promise to me, and he opened up an avenue for me to go to Israel. Uh, he there were there had been avenues opened up to me before, but when I asked him about it, he said, "You know, you still got children to raise, so be patient." But this time, <clears throat> my kids were grown and, and able to take care of themselves, and the father said, "Go to Israel," and I. And I went thinking, okay, this is where it all happened. This is where it all began. And, and I was going to go learn about Judaism. And I was going to be involved in, in all the things that I thought the Father had created. And I got over there. And it wasn't very long be saw, before I saw that they were operating in the same religious spirit Christianity was operating in. You know, they had different names for it, but it was the same spirit. And I became real discouraged. Um, and when, when I finally, you know, came back to the, to the United States, that was another thing he told me when I left. He said, you know, sell everything you have. And I thought he's, he was saying sell everything you have because you're not ever coming back. And I told my children that. That's not what he said. <laughs> he said, sell everything you have and go to Israel. And nothing about never coming back. That was me. Yeah, and plain and simple. Plain and right. simple. Just sell everything you have and go to Israel. Yeah. You, you added the rest. Yeah. Right. I'm <laughs> right. Uh, and I got over there and I got, I got real discouraged because I saw that, um, that Judaism was just a, another man-made religion like Christianity. It wasn't until I got back to America and, and was going through all of that experience that I had had over there in, in trying to validate some stuff in, in the scriptures, I realized Yahweh never once established a religion neither did Yeshua nor did he lend himself to one nor did the apostles they never ever instituted any kind of religion religion that's when I began to see that all these religions what they have in common is they're all man-made now the people that started them had some kind of experience that they thought was, you know, God telling them to do this. But oftentimes, as in the, 
is in the uh, uh, instance of Christianity, it, it was just men building a power base um, in which they were able to exclude anything Hebrew. And when I saw that, I said, Father, I don't, I don't understand why you had me in these different venues for as long as you did. And he told me, Harold, I wanted you to see what not to do. I wanted it to become real to you. I wanted it to live in you and become a part of you, which it has. And I have, I have today, I have, I have no qualms about saying that to people who ask me now. What I have also discerned in this walk after that time on the bench, what he told me was speak only to those who I send across your path and who begin asking you about who you are, what's, what this walk is about. And that takes me back to that instance in the print shop when those ladies, you know, they, they didn't know anything about me, but one of them <clears throat> understood that there was something about me that was different. And that difference was my attitude toward the father. <clears throat> it was in its infancy at the time, but it was there. And uh, I didn't know how to respond to them. I did for the most part. And, you know, other than acknowledging, yeah, you're right. And, and they didn't, I can't remember. They might've, they might've pursued that with a question or two, but uh, what I, the answer I gave them wasn't what they wanted to hear. So they left me alone. But the people that, that, the, that the Father gives us, they're his. In John 17, Yeshua said, Father, I have finished the work you've given to me. And this is going to come up in the next article, the work of the ministry. But he pointed to the 12 and he said, they have, I have, I have manifested your glory and they have received it and they've kept it. And they're now able to be able to go and replicate it. And I have not lost one of these 12 that you've given me. That was the work he said that he had finished. When I first read that, the father said, Harold, I'm giving you a lifetime to do what Yeshua did in <clears throat> three and a half years. And if you can make disciples of 10 people who get it, who are able to keep it, and who are able to replicate it, then you will have finished the work just like Yeshua, and you will be able to stand before me and say, Father, like my elder brother Yeshua, I have finished the work that you've given me. Now, <laughs> what I have discovered is that people come across my path and they stay for a while. And they're very excited and they learn some stuff and then they get to a point where I'm, I have, um, I'm not, I'm not, addressing the things that, that they want to hear. <clears throat> I am. It's just they're not willing to hear it. And they go on someplace else. But these are people who have got it and have kept it. And the Father's teaching them how to replicate it. And, you know, that is the work of the ministry. It's nothing else. It's not building a following. It's not 
Right. You know, when when Yeshua said, Father, I finished the work you've given me, he didn't he didn't talk about all the people that he healed. And it, in my book, that would have been plenty enough um, validation. But he and he didn't he didn't mention the deliverances or <clears throat> the miracles, any of that. He pointed to the 12 and he said, I have manifested your glory to them and they kept it. They got it. That's it. Amen. That's, that's the work of the ministry. We, <clears throat> we become shepherds and we think we have to beget sheep, but we're not equipped to beget sheep. Sheep beget sheep. We're teaching other people, other sheep, how to beget other sheep. That's what the work is about. And the work is when somebody who is inquisitive comes to us and begins to ask us questions, we are manifesting this life that the Father has put in us. That was, I shared that this morning. Where I, we had another Shabbat gathering this morning. And interestingly enough, I shared that, that the best time of my life was when I started questioning what I thought I knew. What I taught, what I thought was true, that is what started this whole thing. Right. If I, if I would not have questioned what I believe, I, I probably would have stayed on the same path. But sort of questioning, why do I believe what I believe? Is it really real? Is it really true? Is it really... And that's what brought me down this road of, wow, just wow. That's, that's where we all began. And that's where these people that would cross our, will cross our path that were to, to share that with, it's where they all begin. And we just have to remember how this journey begins. It, be it begins in people questioning what they think they know is truth. And that's why he's put us here is to be able to answer those questions from the experience that we have, that has been drawn out of us by the father and what we have learned in that experience. Peter says that, right? And, and I think it's in the second book of Peter. He said, always be ready to give an answer for your faith, for your... Right. We don't, we're not commissioned to go gather up all that we can and, and bring them into the um, sharing house. <laughs> Sheep don't beget sheep in the sharing house. That's where they come to get sheared. <laughs> sheep, sheep beget sheep out in the in the field with you know with the shepherd watching them and guiding them into the in proper grazing ground and and, and clean water. Um, that is the um, the work of the ministry. It, it's helping sheep beget sheep. I don't know where Luz went to. I guess she had a, somebody rang her bell. Oh, is she, is she offline? No, she's there. She's just oh. not there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. There she goes. She's taking care of that new dog she got. Right. No, I have my mom here, my niece. My mom just came back. Oh, um, hi, mom. Being out. She's taking off her coat, getting settled in. Okay. So does that help you any at all, Luz? No, it, it does. It, it does. I like hearing you, what you both have to say, because, you know, 
it helps me along the way, you know. Um, it's just, um, you know, it's me, myself, you know, I don't want to make it a me issue because I always feel like I fall back into this place. Um, you know, and I don't know about you guys. I know for me that at times when everything is quiet, I hear the things that I say and I'm like, Lucy, you just have to, you have to do, you know, you have to do whatever it is that I need to do or stop doing and build that relationship with the father. It's just knowing how to, you know, because I feel a lot of times that when I do come before him, however long that may be, because my talking with him is very short because I don't know what to bring before him. And I don't want to repeat the same thing over and over. Um, so it's just, I don't know. Well, as, as one that has repeated things before him over and over and over, uh, I, can, I can guarantee you, Luz, that one of the revelations that came into my life was when I realized that the Father is wanting to speak to me more than I want to. I want to hear him. And, you know, the reason he set this whole thing up is so that we are able to do that. Now, the other thing that I've learned about the father is that he's a perfect gentleman. And he's not going to, you know, go where he's not wanted. Uh, he's not going to stay where he's not invited. But for us who have invited him in, and who are creating a space for him to occupy in us, he's speaking to us all the time. All, we, all he's wanting us to do is to be still and listen and know who he is. And so there's not anything that you can bring before him that's going to disturb him or chase him away, or anything. In those times when you think that you're back in that place that you talked about where it's just me, he's there with you. He knows you. He knows what's going on with you. And so I, sorry. That, that's one of the things that I say to my, not myself, when I have conversation, I'm like, you know what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling because I've like, you know me, so why do I struggle? Why do I continue to come back here? And how do I get myself out of it in you? And it is so frustrating that it makes me want to scream. That's how frustrating. I feel trapped, not in, not where I feel, that I'm in a place where I shouldn't be when it comes to the father. Like I'm not relying, like I'm not trusting him the way I should. Because if I, I keep, I say to myself, if I keep coming back here, it's because I'm not allowing him to freely roam in my heart and in my head. If that makes sense. If, if we, if we look at, at, what you just said from the father's perspective, you know, you're not, you're not, when you do, when you, when you're in that space, you're not sinning. There's nowhere in the 10 words that say, you have to hear me. What we have in hearing him is simply a privilege that we can take advantage of because of the work Yeshua did as a kinsman redeemer for us. He's living in you right now, Luz. And he doesn't, he doesn't flutter off and come back and flutter off and come back. He's living in you. 
and he will not abandon you and he will not leave you um, uh, in a place of distress. What he's looking, what he's looking for, you, you mentioned not able to trust him and, and all of that stuff. Trust is something that's earned. It's not deserved. And that is true with Yahweh, the same as it was with Yeshua. The reason he spent three and a half years with those disciples was to earn their trust. They saw him in uh, every conceivable situation. And he saw, they saw how he um, uh, responded and how he initiated stuff and how he fielded you know, these questions and, and, the, and the answers that he gave, they were with him physically over three and a half years before he could say that they got it and they've kept it and they're able to replicate it. So what's going on with you is a learning space and the more you come and bring this before him and stop and listen, he's going to give you the answer that fits you to help you come out of this. I promise you that. And I can promise you that because I have found that he is trustworthy. He, he, he is He's worthy of our trust. He's, he is in every situation. He's right there with us. And you're, you, you know, how long have you been on this journey now? Well, I'm, I because feel like it's, I, I feel like it's been a lifelong journey. <laughs> However, no. And I say that because from a very young age, Right. I right. have felt, you know, I have felt, I don't know what you want to call it or how to call it, but I have felt him, known him, known of him, didn't know him. I still don't know him the way I should, but I've always felt, even as a child, I don't know if it's fair to say his presence or the call, his calling, I don't know how to word it. However, the journey of the truth in knowing truth, Sabbath started right after a year, maybe before the pandemic. Okay, so three years. <clears throat> you know, after... 30 years, let's come back and address this and see where you are. <laughs> yeah, the other thing, Lou, is that that's, that's interesting to me when I, when I, I because I, <clears throat> having been in mental health all these years and seeing a lot of different things and, and watching people, we, we are usually m very much harder on ourselves than we are on other people. We will sow mercy and compassion to other people faster than we will do it to ourselves. And I think that that's a good lesson to learn, to be able to, to, to be merciful or compassionate with yourself. To not feel that, and, and I, I really, no, that's not a good way to put that. The, 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 the negative um, emotions or, or the unpleasant feelings or those kinds of things that comes with your thinking. If you can find a place in, in yourself that you can be more compassionate or more merciful with yourself, it's, it's an easier time. And I know it's not always easy to practice or to do, but if you can find it in, your, in, in yourself when you're going through these things to be merciful and compassionate and, and accept, it, it, it makes the, makes the journey a, a little less uh, 
uh, of a struggle, I guess, because you can accept yourself for who you are, just like he accepts us for who we are. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Truly, thank you, um, both of you, for, for sharing both of your experiences with me. Um, because I agree, I am really tough on myself. And, and I know that I shouldn't be, but I really, really am. Um, but Well, I want to well, say that... From the father's perspective, Luz, you are among the faithful because you're keeping the, the 10 words of the father. So the struggles that you're going through are not affecting him. It's, it's one of the things that I, that I have discovered is that I can't change myself. I just can't. All I can do is be obedient to his words. And then as a result of that, and, and, and following them and manifesting them the way Yeshua did, as our example, that in, in doing that, it's his responsibility to change me into his likeness, into his image. And, you know, I have discovered over the years that all of my efforts to try to change me were for naught. But the but the 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 things that he has done in me to change me into his likeness and image has stayed. It's stuck. It's it's been it's become life in me. And and I can trust that life. And I would second that. <laughs> so don't be so hard on yourself. Give yourself a break. Yeah, 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 I, I, I know. Just, you know, in, in all your daily activities, you, you just keep thanking the Father for who he is and his goodness in your life and, and just keep thanking him. And, and he will use that avenue to come and transform you into who he is. You know, I can't help but visualize as you, you as you both speak, I visualize me with this mounds and mounds of, you know, uh, what's it called? Just mounds and mounds of backpacks on me. And I just, and I keep visualizing me just taking it and unloading all of it. That's the picture that I have because I feel like I have a bunch of backpacks just mounted and I can't you know one of the things and, and I'll end it with me on this note one of the things that I just my past really comes and torments me myself with my own memories bringing it into here and it doesn't have any business there anymore. And um, it really has its way of making me feel like garbage. And, um, you know, letting that go, part, that's part of one of the backpacks, um, <laughs> letting that go and actually saying and knowing that I, I am free in father. Um, you know, it's one of the one of my my conversations and, and frustrations that I've had with him is, why do I keep it here? Why do I keep bringing it forward? But I know that in time, I have to believe that in time it will be loosened from me and done away with. You know, most people live in the past. 
they, you know, they, they've accumulated all of this, the, these uh, boulders, as you call them, in their, you know, and, and, and they keep trying to relive the past thinking they can change it. And there's not, the past is gone. But the thing that I love about the father, the beauty of the father is that he's just now. It's just right now. And that's what he's concerned with is right now, not what happened back down there somewhere, but right now. And <clears throat> the, other, the other place that people tend to gravitate to is the future. And nobody knows the future. Again, the father is now. And yeah. if we, what? No, no, go ahead. And if we can just learn to be now and close the door on all that stuff in the past, and when it starts to come up, you know, give it to the father. Hey, Father, here it is. I'm giving it to you. I'm, I'm unburdening myself on you. You know, that's what he asks us to do. Having and, worked in, in mental health and addictions for the years that I've worked in, I've noticed that the people that live in the past are depressed. And the people that live in the future are extremely anxious. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense, right? Yeah. 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 So if we can if we can learn to live in the now, then the depression goes away, the anxiety goes away because we're living for now. Because he's now, he is of the now. I've always liked that when I first heard it because it's so true to me. Um, if I don't if I don't remember anything else, one thing I do remember is that father is everlasting and he is right now and he's not there in the back he's i don't think there in the future he is right now i mean he's just all oh, he's right now and that's something that i do think about often he's right now so when all right of those matters when all of those memories of the past start invading your your brain just remind yourself of that, that the Father's now. This is not a part of him. It's not part of me anymore. I'm now in the now with him. Thank you, Father. Thank you for, for allowing me to be in the now with you. And see, that changes our focus from off of the past and onto the, to who he is. And as we get, as we come into that space more and more often, it becomes a natural place for us and it becomes easier to, to get there. Um, but it does take exercise. You gotta, you gotta work it, you gotta do it. But the more you do it, the fi you'll find that, that that stuff won't be as prominent. There's a scripture that says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Amen. And when you're making something, it means that there's a work. A lot of the, a lot of the translations say set you free, but some of the translations say make you free, meaning that there is a work in progress. So you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Amen. Okay, that sounds like a good note to end on. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. If you've been watching, thank you for being here with us. And again, if you'd like to join us next Shabbat, send me an email and we'll be glad to, to have you. So until next Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.